You know, back in the Old Testament days when they did the Passover, they not only the lamb had to be slain, but the blood had to be applied. Uh, you could have been there that day and with your family and you could have took a lamb and you could have slayed that lamb. You could have had it as the Passover and done everything you're supposed to do. But if you didn't apply the blood, there would have been no salvation in your home. And uh, I'm thankful for that the blood's been applied. You know, I, someone said, what happened to the blood of Jesus when he died on the cross? Some say that it just spilled upon the ground. I, 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 don't, I don't agree with that statement. The blood did not spill upon the ground, but Jesus took his very blood to the mercy seat in heaven, and he offered it for you and I. And I'm looking forward to the day. I, I happen to believe when we get to heaven, we get to see the blood of Jesus. We'll get to see his precious blood, because there is, is a fountain. There still is a fountain. Think about that. And I'm thankful for the blood of Christ, thankful for being here tonight, and what a wonderful song, what a wonderful day, and we're looking forward to what the Lord's going to do tonight. Once you take your Bibles, go with me to 2 Chronicles chapter number 29. We're going to continue with these Old Testament revivals, and uh, I enjoyed preaching on heaven. I enjoy preaching on heaven, don't enjoy preaching on hell, but I've always, uh, in my ministry, I've always I made the case. If I preach on hell, I'm going to preach on heaven not long after that. And uh, so I, I enjoy preaching on heaven. I heard the story of this lady one time, her and her husband. And uh, he is getting ready to pass away. And he told her, he said, I want, you to, I want you to take all my assets and write a check. Just one check. And said, I want you to put it up in the attic of the house. And when I die and when I'm passing through, I'll grab that check so I'll have it. And she said, all right, I'll do that for you. And, and so lo and behold, he passes away, and she takes everything he owns, put it in one account, and she wrote that check, that big old check, and she stuck it up in the attic, like he said. Well, about two or three weeks later, she got to thinking about that check. And she went up in the attic, and that check was still sitting there. And she said, I knew I should have put it in the basement. That's bad, isn't it? But she knew him. <laughs> she knew what kind of man he was. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter number 29. We're going to be looking at a revival uh, that, is, that started with a king by the name of Hezekiah. And we'll read a few verses and we'll stay uh, around this chapter for this evening. But let's begin in verse 1. Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and twenty years old. And he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abjiah, and the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them, and he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves, and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. For our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God. And have forsaken him, and have turned away their face from the habitation of the Lord, and turned their backs. Also, they have shut up the doors of the porch, and put out the lamps, and have not burned incense, uh, nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Wherefore the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he hath delivered them to trouble, to astonishment, and to hissing, as you see with your eyes. For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord our God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. Let's pray. Father, we thank Thee again for tonight. We thank You, Father, uh, Lord, for already working in the service Lord, we thank you for that wonderful song we just heard about your precious blood. 
And Lord, that it's been applied. And I pray, Lord, that all of us here tonight, we've had that blood applied to our lives. And Lord, that we know that we're on our way to heaven. Now, Father, as we come to this time, we realize our great need of Thee. And Lord, I pray that You'd open up the Scriptures to us tonight as we study them for just a little while. And Lord, that You would help us to understand, uh, Lord, the great need that we have today. Lord, we need revival in our land. And Lord, let us glean something from Your Word tonight that will, Lord, that will spark a fire down in our soul. And Lord, that one day we will experience a great revival as they did in the days of old. Bless now, in Jesus' name, amen. We are reading here Hezekiah. Hezekiah is one of the good kings. You see that it says, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Hezekiah sparks a great revival, a lasting revival throughout the land of Israel. You say, were they in need of revival? They were... <laughs> Are constantly in need of revival. That would be like asking, do we really need revival today? And I think all of us would have to say, yes, we're in great need of revival in our land. You know, the nation of Israel and the, and the United States of America have a lot of things in common. Uh, you, you, you read the history of Israel and you see what went on there. You can see a lot of it that's going on in our day. For instance, the king that was before Hezekiah was a king by the name of Ahaz. And Ahaz was king for around 16 years. And you see there just a, a chapter before in chapter number 28 and look in verse number 19 what it says about him. For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. For he made Judah naked and transgressed sore against the Lord. Here was a king that was part of a so-called, can I put it this way, what we'd say about America today? We say America is a Christian nation, but I'm afraid we're far from it. But we're supposed to be a Christian nation. Here's a nation, the nation of Israel, that's supposed to be founded on the principles of the Word of God on Jehovah, and here's a king, King Ahaz, who serves Balaam, who serves a false god, and uh, we can make comparisons today. We see that going on. In his reign in 16 years, you'll find, if you go back, we won't take time to read it, but when you get a chance, read uh, uh, the, the, the chapters on Ahaz, and you'll see that during his reign, their, their military was at their weakest point. Their weakest point. You know, there's just something about it. When you get away from God, God takes that away from you. And we've seen in our nation, when, when we're far removed from God, we can see as a, we're not the power that we used to be as a nation. You know, other countries used to fear the United States of America. We're not feared like we used to be feared. Uh, you know, they, they don't really care about us anymore. And you say, is that, a phys is that a military problem? Is that a leadership problem? I, I say it's a spiritual problem that we have in our land. There was not only a time of military weakness, but Ahaz would try to use a diplomacy. And he would try to get leagues with different nations around him, and they always failed. I don't know about you, but when I think of Ahaz and the condition the land was in, I, I don't have to look too far to see that that's where we're at in the United States of America. We're, we're not any better. <laughs> we're getting worse. And uh, listen, as a nation, we're getting further and further away from God. Getting away from what the foundational principles of the Word of God. And uh, you say, what needs to happen? We need some Hezekiahs. That's what we need. We're going to look at this man in just a moment. But for a country to get back to where they need to be, there ha it starts with men who stand up and do what they're supposed to do. That's how it happens. It starts with leadership. It doesn't start... You can Listen, we can blame it all on the politicians we want to, but the blame does not fall on a politician. 
It doesn't fall on the politician. I remember, I forget who it was, some poet from years ago from, uh, uh, from France came over and he said, what made America great was not the politicians, but it was the churches. And it was the pulpits in those churches. See, if preachers would get back to preaching the Word of God and telling people what's right and what's wrong, you know, uh, America might not be in the condition it's in today. And so many people have strayed away from telling the truth because we're so afraid we're going to offend somebody. You know, listen, I, I, I want to be kind. I want to be compassionate. And listen, I want to be everybody's friend. But the most important thing I can do is be obedient to the Lord and preach whatever He says to preach. And preach the Word of God. And uh, listen, that's what you should want as a church. Somebody that will thunder the Word of God no matter what because he wants to please the Lord and do what's right. And that's what Hezekiah was. Hezekiah was that type of king. And so we want to look at his life in just a minute here and walk through this passage. And I want you to see some things about Hezekiah. He was a young man. He wasn't as young as Josiah. But he was uh, 25 years old when he began to reign over the nation there of Israel. But I want you to notice, first of all, about Hezekiah. He was a man with purpose. He was a man in purpose. Look at a verse well we read, chapter 29, verse 10. Notice what it says here. Now it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel, that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. He was a man with purpose. This was not just, you know, he wasn't a man of lip service. But he was a man that had a purpose in his heart that he was going to do what's right. And listen, you and I, we need to find purpose in our heart. We need to have a heart to do what's... If your heart's in it, you'll do it, right? If your heart's in it, you'll do it. If, if it's something that consumes you, you get excited about it, Listen, you're, you're not going to let anybody tell you any different or, 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 or stop you from doing it. This time of year, this time of year, a lot of people get excited about Bambi running through the yard. A lot of people do. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it. I like to eat a little bit of it myself. Nothing wrong with it. But it's amazing how, how men get excited about hunting. And I mean, they'll get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. They'll put camouflage on that hadn't been washed in 15 years. Because if you wash it, then the deer will smell that, you know. So you make sure it's not been washed. And you'll get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. You'll make all these sacrifices just to crawl out and get up in a tree stand and sit there and wait for Bambi to walk by. And I mean, it consumes you. You're excited about it. It's in your heart. That's wonderful. But when's the last time we got up at 3 o'clock in the morning saying, this is church day? Man, I can't, I, I can't well, I've already got my church clothes laid out because I laid them out Saturday night. I'm ready to go. I'm excited. I can't wait to get to the house of God. You know, if it's in our heart, listen, he had a heart for it. He had a purpose. God help us to have a purpose. We want revival. We're going to have to get some purpose in us. It can't be, you know, we got too much flippant Christianity. It's not something we do flippantly. But listen, it needs to be something done with purpose. He was a man of purpose. I must go on. He was a man of action. Look in verse 3 of chapter 29. He in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And repaired them. Now what I want you to know about, he didn't wait on somebody to do it. Hezekiah did it himself. He didn't wait on the priest to go open the doors. But he, he went out himself and he took care of it and he opened the doors. He took some initiative. He took some initiative. He is a man of purpose. He is a man of action. Can I say this? He was a man of wisdom. He is a man of wisdom. Now, in verses 4, we done read it. I'm not going to read all that. But in verses 4 through 11, you'll see 
the Hezekiah, he got together the leaders of the land and he counseled with them. He understood some things. He's used some wisdom. He got some other men involved. And uh, he found out what they were doing. He found out, is their heart in it? And Hezekiah got them together, so he's a man of wisdom. Another thing about him, look in verse number 2. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according, now notice this phrase, according to all that David, his father, had done. He was a man of integrity and zeal. Now, many kings, it says, you can look at the list of kings, and it'll either say, they did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, or they did that which was evil. But here with Hezekiah, it goes a little further. It says, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, did. It took it a step further. He was a man of integrity and a man of zeal. And listen, if we won't see revival, it's going to take purpose, it's going to take action, it's going to take some wisdom, and it's going to take some men with some integrity and zeal. Man, we need some zeal and some boldness for the Lord. And that's what Hezekiah had here. So we see this man of revival. Then I want you to see the method of revival. What happened here? And a lot of these things are the same, but let's look at it and see what happened. First of all, he opened the house of the Lord. That's pretty simple, isn't it? I mean, that's the first thing he did. The first thing he did is he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and he repaired them. I don't know about you, but church is important to me. Church is important. Someone says, why is church important? Well, it could be because Jesus said he gave himself for the church. He's washed the church in his own blood. Church is important. It's important. And he opened the house of the Lord. That's the first thing. Listen, if we're going to have revival, there's going to have to be a coming back to the house of the Lord. God's people are going to have to get a desire again to be in God's house. He opened the house of the Lord. He not only did that, but he gave instruction to the priest. Now again, in verses 5 through 11, we'll not take time to read it, but I'll give you basically the instructions he gave. The first thing he did is he confessed their sins and their father. See, you can't go no further until you admit the sins. He talks about their filthiness. He pointed it out. The filthiness of the holy place. Until we realize we're sinners, listen, we're not going to go any further. Until we, until we clean up, you know, as the Bible talks about the, you know, the beam in your eye, but you're worried about that little moat in your brother's eye. Well, listen, until we are able to get to the place we can deal with our sin, we can't worry about anybody else's. You know, you, you may want to point all the fingers you want to point, but until you get your own act cleaned up, it don't do no good pointing fingers. We got to deal with our own sin. And Hezekiah tells them that. Then he points out the lack of preaching of the Word of God. He said, listen, nothing's been going on in here. The lamps are not burning anymore. You're not burning incense. And uh, he said, you're, you're not doing anything you're supposed to do. He said, that, listen, that's got to get back. And then he tells them they were in trouble in these verses. And he reminds them of their responsibility. Now, sometimes we don't like that, do we? Let's be honest. Sometimes we don't like instruction. You know, sometimes we don't like somebody telling us we're wrong. We don't like that. But listen, the Bible says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. We need to be told. We need to be told there's things that need to be changed in our lives. He gave them instruction. He opened the house of the Lord. He called for church services again. In this passage, look in verse, uh, beginning verse 20 of chapter number 29. Look in verse 20. It says, Then Hezekiah the king rose early and gathered the rulers of the city and went up to the house of the Lord. And then he goes on and he mentions the offerings here. The sin offering, the burn offering, and the thanks offering. And what happens here is, is he calls for church service. Hezekiah, I mean, he's a man. He's purposed in his heart. He said, listen, I want my country 
to get back to where they're supposed to be. So he opens the house of God. He gives instructions. And then they begin to do the service of the Lord. They, first of all, the sin offering. They are reminded again. You say, what is the sin offering? It's just, it just helps us to remember what the Lord Jesus has done for us. You know, the greatest thing that you can remember every day is what Jesus has done for you. Never, please, never stray too far from Calvary. Always keep your eyes on Calvary. Because it's a, you say, what is Calvary is what's got you in this thing, and Calvary is what keeps you in it. You don't get away from it. You don't get away from it. It's Calvary that refreshes us. Samson, he took that, remember, took that jawbone of that ass, and he took that jawbone, and he slew all them Philistines. That, that jawbone gave him the victory. But then later on, remember Samson, he was weak and he was tired and he was thirsty. He didn't think he could go on anymore. What did God use to refresh him? That same jawbone. And out of that jawbone came water and refreshed Samson. You say, what is that? That's a picture of Calvary. The same thing that gives me victory is the same thing that refreshes me every day when I think about what the Lord Jesus has done for me. And listen, don't stray away from Calvary. That's the sin offering. What's the burn offering? The burn offering was a sign of letting God clean them up. Letting God clean them up. You know, you know something that's very difficult for us to do? You know, the psalmist said, Create in me a clean heart, O God. But when's the last time that you got serious with God? And you said, God... Cut on your holy flashlight, shine it in my soul, and show me where I'm wrong. We don't do that. You say, why don't we do that? Because we know we will. We're afraid of what he might show. Because a lot of times we think we're just okay, right? We're good, you know. We're pretty good Christians. We come to church. You know, we do what's right. We read our Bible. We pray. But you know, it might not hurt to ask God to turn that flashlight on. He shows things that we normally don't see. And He reveals things to us that we need to get right with Him. That's the burnt offering. Then you have the thank offering. This is, listen, they gave themselves to the Lord with this offering. All this was taking place. What was this? This was revival. Because one man, not a priest... Not a prophet. Isaiah was alive during this time, but it wasn't Isaiah. But it was the king Hezekiah who purposed in his heart. He took action. He got the people together, and he said, this is what we're going to do. And because of that, revival came. And revival came when people began to get thoroughly right with the Lord. Now, what happened? There's results. There's res you know, there's always a results for revivals. You read about revivals that happened years ago. They left lasting results. I remember hearing about revivals taking place. I can't remember who it was, but revival taking place in old mining communities. And the revival swept in and all those miners got saved, got born again. And uh, when they got back to work, they had to retrain all the mules because the miners had gotten saved and their language had changed. So they didn't use that type of language anymore. And so the mules didn't know what to do. Had to retrain all of them. You know, they said when Billy Sunday would come into a town and a rot revival would break out under Billy Sunday, when he would leave, the beer joints would shut down. See, real revival leaves results. Something happens when real revival comes. What happens here? Well, look at chapter 31 in verse number 1. Here's the first thing that happens. Verse thir verse, chapter 31, verse 1 says, Now when all this was finished, all Israel uh, that were present went out to the cities of Judah and break the images in pieces and cut down the groves and threw down the high places. And the altars out of Judah and Benjamin and Ephraim also in Manasseh 
until they had utterly destroyed them all. Then all the children of Israel returned, every man to his possession and to their own cities. You just say, what happened here? Well, listen, all those idols, everything they were worshiping, that they were putting before God, it was taken out of the way. You know what happens when revival comes? All those things in our lives that we put before the Lord Jesus that is more important to us than to Him, they get taken out of the way. That's what happened when revival comes. You say, preacher, what are those things? I don't know. You know what they are. I know what they are in my life. You know what they are in your life. But there are things that we put before Him. And listen, when true revival comes, them things will be no more. Look in chapter 29. Back in chapter 29. Look down in verse number 34. Not only will I, the idols uh, be destroyed, but we see in chapter 29 and verse 34 that public worship was restored. Verse 34 says, But the priests were too few so that they could not fillet all the burnt offerings. Wherefore their brethren, the Levites, did help them till the work was ended and until the other priests had sanctified themselves. For the Levites were more upright in heart to sanctify themselves than the priests. You say, what's this talking about? Well, listen, so many people came out to this worship service. So many people were bringing in their offerings that the priests could not keep up with it. There was so much going on, this public worship. They were the, the priests, there were too few priests to be able to handle it. And they had to get the Levites to come over and to help them with the offering. You say, what is a, a result of revival? Listen, public worship will be restored. People will come. Some people say, well, revival is lost people getting saved. Revival has nothing to do with lost people getting saved. Revival is when God's people get right, and when God's people get right, then lost people get saved. That's the order that it goes. And you know, if, if, if we become a church that's on fire for God, listen, there's no doubt people are going to see there's something going on. John Wesley used to say, he said, I just light myself on fire and people come watch me burn. Everybody likes to go to a fire, don't they? I mean, growing, you hear sirens going up, you know, you jump in the car and you want to follow it because you want to see what's going on. Everybody likes to see a fire. And listen, if God gets a hold of you, God gets a hold of our church, listen, people want to see what's going on. They'll want to see what's on fire. So we see, listen, idols are destroyed. Worship is restored. Listen, people, look here, people practice holiness. Look in chapter 30. Verse 15, look what happens here. Look in verse 15. Then they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the second month, and the priests and the Levites were shamed and sanctified themselves and brought in the burnt offerings into the house of the Lord. And they stood in their place after their manner, according to the law of Moses, the man of God. The priests sprinkled the blood which they received of the hands of the Levites, for there were many in the congregation that were not sanctified. Therefore the Levite had the charge of the killing of the Passover for everyone that was not clean to sanctify themselves unto the Lord. That word sanctified, you see it several times here. It's the same thing as holiness. It means to be set apart. And here's what happened. When revival comes, people began to be set apart for God. Set apart for His use. You know, that's what happens. That's a result of revival. That's a result of revival. It brings God's people to the place, listen, uh, that they want to be like Jesus in every way. And God help us. We need that. Listen, you can't can't just, this world is looking. You say, what's this world looking for? This world is not looking for, for another cheap invita- imitation of themselves. Some people think, well, you got to be like the world to get the world. No, they don't want that. They want to see something's different. They want to see somebody that's in love with Jesus. They want to see somebody that has set their life apart to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And listen, that's what happened. That was a result of this revival. People practiced holiness. And then the fourth thing, the nation was blessed again with prosperity. Look in chapter number 32. Chapter number 32 and verse 27. Look what happens here after this great revival. And Hezekiah, verse 27, And Hezekiah had exceedingly much riches and honor. He made himself treasuries of, for silver and for gold and for precious stones and for spices and for shields and for all manner of pleasant jewels. Storehouses also for the increase of corn and wine and oil and stalls for all manners of beasts and coats for flocks. Moreover, he provided him cities and possessions of flocks and herd in abundance, for God had given him substance very much. Now, I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel tonight. But listen, when revival comes, when, when God sees that we spiritually turn to Him, God will take care of all the physical things. God will take care... You know, you look at the kings of Israel, and uh, you see when, when they get right with God, God takes care of those other armies that are coming after them. God takes care of the droughts and the lack of substance. See, it's not, it, it, you say, well, we need this, we need this in our country, and that in our country, and we need this to cover that, and oh, we're so much in debt, and, and, and we're looking at the physical part of it. The physical part is not what the problem is. The problem goes deeper, it's spiritual. And our country's in a spiritual wreck. And that's the reason everything else is in a wreck. And that's why we need to have a purpose and a desire to want revival. You say, can we do anything about it? We might not can do anything about this country, but you can do something right where you live. You can do something about your home. You can do something about your own individual life. And if you get your individual life right and your home right and you come to church, listen, I tell you, what will that do? It'll get the church right. And God can send a revival. But it takes a purpose in our heart. Are we, do we really, here's the question. Here's really the question tonight. Do we really want it? It's not a matter, can we have it? It's a matter, do we want it? Do we really want revival? Would you bow with me in prayer? It's easy to say lip service. <laughs> I understand, I'm there. It's easy to say, yes, I want it, but it's a different thing to be willing to do whatever it takes to have it. It's difficult to say, Lord, in the privacy of your own home, in your prayer closet or wherever you may be, just you and God. It's difficult to say, God, show me where I'm wrong. God, have I, have I said something? Have I had an ill word towards your brother? God, show me. Show me so that I can go apologize. God, what have I done? God, show me where I'm wrong. For revival to come, that's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to say, search me, O God, and know my heart today.